The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got to the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly this is the Son of God, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Normally, we jump right into the gospel lesson, uh, and we're going to get to that in just a minute, but I really want to take a look at the first lesson from Kings, Um, this this great story about Elijah on a mountain and finding God in the sheer silence. But how does Elijah get up there? What's really going on in this story? And so let's take a step back and kind of look at where we're at in the biblical narrative. Kings is, 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 is divided into two books, First and Second Kings, but it's really one book, kind of like Luke and Acts, kind of read like chapter 1 and 2. Um, and, uh, and it's basically a storyline about all the different kings that took charge during the time between David and his death and the Syrian exile. So that's kind of where we're at in the biblical narrative. And it starts off with David's dying, and he hands over power to Solomon, his son. And Solomon's the one that builds the temple, the big, beautiful temple, and it has all the measurements for it, and it reminds us of when the ark was being built for the animals to come aboard, and also the ark of the covenant during, during in the wilderness. And so Solomon builds this great ornate temple to be like the new Eden, the place where God will dwell, the house of God, and the innermost place of it. And Solomon builds a nice big chair for himself and sits down right in the middle of it and is king and starts to take power, and starts to abuse his power, and take advantage of things, and starts taking advantage of people, and other tribes, and other lands, and other places, and even takes on more wives, and starts worshiping other gods, and it's not looking good. And then after him come his sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and I'm probably saying it wrong, and so in seminary, we called them Ray and Jay. Um, We also had two professors named Ray and Jay, so it was easy for us to remember, and they both tear apart the kingdom. One takes the south, one takes the north. Now there's this divided kingdom, just a generation past David, this united group of people have now torn it apart and abusing all the power. And the rest of Kings talks about all the other kings that come after them that do exactly the same thing. They abuse the power, they're worshiping other things, they're they're, they're taking advantage of people. And during this time frame, God sends prophets to speak wisdom to these kings. Now, prophets aren't fortune tellers. They are people that, are, that have been chosen to speak on behalf of God to bring people back in line with the covenant, the things that they learned about and knew about for their, for their ancestry with Moses and all the commandments and Abraham and being chosen. And so the prophets would come in and say, you're, you're taking advantage of people. That's going against the covenant. To stop doing that. Let's get back into this relationship with, with God, the relationship with the divine bring us back into the covenantal relationship. Now, you can imagine that these people, these kings that are in power, don't really like to hear what the prophets have to say. So much so that this continues over and over again, and God warns, if you don't listen to these people, you will be exiled, and we all know that that's what ends up happening. Over and over again, king after king after king has a prophet trying to help them out, and they just keep turning away from it, and it ends up being that they are exiled. There's only a handful of kings that actually do some really positive things in the book of Kings. It's a fascinating read. (laughs) Anyway, Elijah is the last prophet. All of them have been killed off, and he 
has an arch nemesis named King Ahab, who's married to a woman named Jezebel. And you may know stories about Ahab and Jezebel. I'm not going to go into all those, but I will say this, is that they did not like Elijah, and they, King Ahab and Jezebel, wanted to worship the Canaanite god Baal, B-A-A-L, which was in our scripture today. And the Canaanite god of Baal was being worshipped by uh, uh, all of these other people, and then they said the Israelites should now worship him as well, and enters Elijah saying, hey, guys, that's not part of the covenantal relationship. Maybe we shouldn't be doing idolatry. I'm pretty sure that's part of the first two commandments, and they don't like what he has to say. And so Elijah even challenges like 450 prophets of this Canaanite Baal to, a, to a, like this duel. It says, if you can produce, you know, your gods, go for it. I'll be over here with my little altar. And wouldn't you know it, fire comes up and God is made known in this one altar of Elijah. And, and Ahab and Jezebel don't like this and threaten to kill Elijah. And so he runs and he heads up a mountain. And that's where we're at in our scripture today. They find himself on Mount Horeb, which is also known as Mount Sinai. Does that one sound familiar? Yeah, that's where Moses receives the commandments, and that's where Moses is talking with God, and God is made known in the powerful wind, and God is made known in the fire, and the people down below are feeling the earth shake, and they know that the presence of God is there. And so Elijah's up on this mountain. I need help, God. I'm fearful for my life. And God says, go out to the edge, and, God, and the Lord will pass by you. And so this big wind comes through, moving rocks and stuff, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And then this big fire happens, but the Lord's not in the fire. And that earthquake happens, but the Lord's not in the earthquake. Where was the Lord? Do you remember? In the sheer silence. Now, the Hebrew word for this uh, doesn't really translate very well. And so this is the best translation they could come up with was the sheer silence. Um, other people call it the whispers, or some people call it the... Um, um, well, I forgot it already, but there's other ways, t the tiny, tiny whispers or, or the um, still small voice, thank you, still small voice is another way that it gets translated. The best way to describe it, though, is a void of sound. So do me a favor, if you're able to and you're willing, I want you to take your fingers and just put them into your ears for two seconds. Just be quiet. Go. Okay. It's that deafening quiet. God is there. This is important because the people that are exiled are hearing this story, are learning about this, and are recognizing that they are without God in this wilderness. Where is God? And now the prophet's even reminding them that even when it's all quiet and nothing is heard, there is God. God is with you. So, Elijah then hears the voice of God saying, go back down, appoint Elisha to be the next prophet who's going to do twice as many miracles that you've already done. And then I want you to go and appoint these two other people to be kings over Ahab. And so he goes down and appoints these other kings, which I'm sure they were fantastic kings. They weren't according to the storyline. Never mind. All right. Let's transition now to the gospel lesson. Our gospel comes from Matthew. It's the next thing that happens after last week's gospel about the feeding of the 5,000. And, and if you haven't listened to that one, go check it out online. It's about abundance. It was Pastor Heather gave us a great sermon on that. Um, and then now today we see that Jesus dismisses the crowds and tells the disciples to go in the boat and go on over into the sea. And I always imagine at this point in time that all 10,000 people are gathered together holding kids and holding hands and dragging baskets of fish and bread as little kids are picking up the pieces that are falling out because there's just so much left over. And it's now that the people are gone and now that the disciples are off away that Jesus is able to go up on the mountain finally to be by himself. He's been trying to for a couple of chapters to get away by himself and now finally he gets a chance and he's able to grieve the loss of John the Baptist. And, and so there he is up by himself on this mountain and then it's evening and he starts to come back down. And that's when he sees the boat out being battered by the waves and the wind and there's chaos and the, and the disciples are trying to keep the boat steady. Now, my wife and I, Becca, went kayaking this summer at the Gulf of Mexico. 
and we have ocean kayaks. We got them for our wedding. It was it's a long story. But we took these kayaks out on the Gulf for the first time, and they're made to go over the waves. You point it in one direction, and you hit the wave straight on, and you can go over the waves. And it's so much fun. And then all of a sudden, you get to where you're going to turn around. And so at the end of one wave, and before the next one comes, you turn around. You know where this is going. You turn around the kayak, and then you get to surf all the way back in. And it's so much fun. We had such a great time doing that until you didn't make the turn. <laughs> And then the wave would hit you, and you'd lose the kayak, and it hits you in the head. You lose your glasses, and you come up out of the water, and you have to chase it down before it runs over a toddler playing on the beach. <laughs> True story? Yeah. Uh, but I was thinking about that time in the kayak as I was just having this great time battling these waves. And it took a lot of work to get over those waves when you're paddling out there and staying straight the whole time. But what would have I have been thinking had somebody come walking to me in the Gulf of Mexico, over those five and six foot waves, I would have been out of my mind. I would have been like, this is nuts. I've got to get out of here as fast as possible. So I keep thinking of Peter in that boat as it's rocking back and forth and the waves are splashing upon it. All they're trying to do is just keep it steady. And it's just so ruckus and there's wind and it's wet everywhere. And all of a sudden there's this figure walking toward them and they're like, it's a ghost. And they're all filled with fear. And that's whenever he says, don't be afraid, it is I. And in the Greek, it translates as, I am. Now, we heard that before, haven't we? The God of the I am from Moses and Abraham and creation is now with them at the boat. And that's when Peter's like, oh, if it's you, God, can I come out there and join you? And Jesus is like, come on, Peter, come on in. And Peter gets out of the boat, and they start walking. And all of a sudden, he hits the wind, and the waves splash up against him, and he gets fearful again. And what happens to Peter? He sinks, yes. Help me, Lord. You know, and then Jesus picks him up out of the water and says, why do you doubt? Have faith. And places him in the boat, and it goes calm. Now, this isn't the first time that Jesus has been in a boat with the disciples. Do you remember the time before where he's asleep on the boat, and they're still battered by the wind and the waves, and they're so nervous? What are we going to do? Somebody wake him. You wake him up. No, you wake him up. And Jesus wakes up and says, calm. And they said, wow, this guy can control the weather and calm the seas. Well, now these disciples in the presence of the I am are saying, truly this is the Son of God. And they are in the presence of the divine, showed up to them in the most unexpected way. What great news we have for us today. What great stories have been gifted us today. That God is present in the chaos in the, in, the, in the waves, and the wind, and the noise, and also in the sheer silence and everywhere in between. And I bring this up because I can't help but think of, of, our, of our friends and, and loved ones that are in Hawaii right now, that they had to dive out into the ocean to escape the fire. And now they're dealing with trying to rebuild and, and, and the loss of life and, and, and all of the in-between, the emotions, and now that it's starting to get quiet to let them know and to remind ourselves that God is with them in this time, that God is with them in this space, and that God will be with them in the days ahead. I think about our own country and, and, the, and the political division and rhetoric that we hear. Talk about noise. Talk about chaos. Talk about the cacophony of sound that's happening. God is present in the middle of all of it. Do not be afraid. Don't doubt. Have faith. We are being called right back into that relationship with God, back into that covenantal relationship. God is with us. And God comes to us in the most unexpected times and places whenever we all of a sudden have to take all of our laundry to the laundromat because the, the washer broke. God is there. When we're logging onto that Zoom meeting and we don't want to show our face, God is there. When we're taking that daily commute and the car zooms past us, God is is there. When we go have that cup of coffee with our, with our close friend and, and play catch up, God is there. When we're tucking our kids in at night, God is there. When the baby cries at baptism, God is there. God is there in the most unexpected ways. When we are pausing to pray for our loved ones and our friends that are dealing with sickness, that are dealing with addiction, that are dealing with death, that are dealing with the loss of a pet. God is there. And God is also there in the joy that every parent is feeling because tomorrow is school. 
God is there. God will meet us everywhere we go. And the good news is that God is in this space right now with each and every one of us. The I am is present, calling us back every second from fear into faith to walk with God in this covenantal relationship. As we walk out those doors, the same God meets us. As the heat hits us, as we get into our cars, the same God is with us. As we go to the next space, the same God is with us at every single stop. When we go home and we lay our head on our pillow tonight and we wake in the morning, God is with us. And we get the joy and the pleasure to take that God with us everywhere and share it with others in everything that we say and everything that we do and even in our thoughts take the fear that we may have and just align that faith back into that divine relationship with the I am. Because God is present in the chaos and even in the sheer silence. Amen.